On day three of Lister Week, I am delighted to introduce Mr. Nigel Jameson. Nigel is a consultant pancreatic surgeon at Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Nigel is also a scientist at Glasgow University and undertakes translational research focusing on the immune system and alterations in pancreatic cancer. It therefore seems very appropriate that Nigel, a surgeon and a scientist, just like Joseph Lister, will today tell us about advances in modern surgery. Thanks Kate for the introduction and thank you to Friends of GRI. I have looked on in awe as you have unearthed so many treasures about Glasgow Royal Infirmary over the last few months, preserving the historical legacy of the institution that is so important to patients and staff um, in Glasgow and throughout the world has really has been so vital and I'm really happy to see this being done. As a surgeon, it was a considerable honour to be asked to be tasked with the opportunity to explore Joseph's, Joseph Lister's influence and impact in Glasgow and throughout the world. And through my very detailed research that I've been undertaking over the last few months, I have uncovered a number of similarities and character traits between us. Firstly, I am notoriously slow operating. And secondly, in the face of any temporary difficulty during an operation, I am known to sweat profusely, as was he. Fortunately for mankind, however, he was not afflicted by any of my other deficits. And today I will attempt to show you that modern surgery would not have been possible without him. As I make my way to work in Glasgow Royal Infirmary, as I walk out my house, I pass this plaque. Home of Joseph Lister, while he worked in Glasgow from 1860 to 1869. And I've often thought what that time would have been like for a surgeon in Glasgow. But as a surgeon during the last 12 months of the COVID-19 pandemic, I have been aware of these words. It may seem a strange principle to enunciate as a first requirement in a hospital that it should do the sick no harm. These are the words of Florence Nightingale. And as we experienced a year ago when we first faced a novel contagion in SARS-CoV-2, the unknown mechanism of transmission made caring for our patients challenging. And so it was in the time of Lister when he began his career that exposure to the bad air was thought in some way to be responsible for infection and sepsis. The concept of microorganisms and the way they could invade the wound were not known. So, Joseph Lister was born in 1827 into a Quaker family. He was destined for greatness, some would say, but in actual fact, he was probably a second stage of a, of a rocket set off by his father, Joseph Jackson Lister. He was a wine merchant with an interest in engineering and had worked to develop the achromatic lens as part of the compound microscope. And with this, he assisted Thomas Hodgkin in his work and was ultimately made a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1832. And so Lister was exposed to an early age to a microscopic world. He had a precocious talent for observation and drawing and had numerous sketchbooks which are shown here. And he also enjoyed dissecting small animals. And so it was needless to say that he had a passion for being a surgeon from a very young age. And from, and from that work, two of his, his earliest papers, including um, the analysis and microscopy of the, of the iris, of the eye, and also the muscles of the skin, were born out, and so his love of, of, of phys physiology and microscopy were evident in those. It was during his, during December 1946, they had the opportunity to be present in an operating theatre as Robert Liston performed the first operation in Europe under ether. Up until that point, the great Edinburgh surgeon Liston was famous for performing amputations in under a minute. Time me, gentlemen, he would proclaim, time me, gentlemen. But, infa but infamous for the likely exaggerated operation where not only did the patient and the insistent both die from gangrene following infections, but the spectator was so scared he was stabbed that he died as well. So this fiasco was described as the only operation with a 300% mortality. But at the same time, during the operation, he would pronounce the Yankee Dodge gentleman 
beats mesmerism hollow. And so ether anesthesia was something that 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 that, that would have would certainly have been an important influence in Lister from from that time. And his love, and so I think his love for for being a surgeon was truly born. His father had encouraged him to take up an arts degree first of all, and that was at University College London. And as a Quaker, that was the only university that would would take him in. And following that, he would start his medical career in the same university. However, not um, at that time, Lister, Lister also faced significant challenges. In 1847, he developed sm smallpox, and this affliction would, would be one that would have killed his brother. He also developed a nervous breakdown, and so it was that he required a period of recuperation in Ireland for almost a year before he would really take up his medical uh, medical training. Another uh, period of, of, of difficulty would have been faced by, by Lister when in spring 1847, John Phillips Potter, an anatomy demonstrator at University College London, sustained a scratch to his knuckle. At that time, the Lancet uh, and 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 for for three weeks he was unwell. Sepsis took on and eventually he died. The Lancet commented, "We can deliver our artisans of the mine and the loom, and the wheel from the dangers of their calling, but our art is filled hitherto of delivering, is is failed hitherto of delivering our own workers from this destructive poison." Joseph Lifter would have been taught by this young man in in, in an anatomy demonstration and would certainly have been present at his funeral, and. And so this man missed the opportunity of going on to be Robert Liston's assistant surgeon. But Lister had other mentors. Rather than becoming an anatomy demonstrator himself, he chose to be surgical dresser to the great Sir Eric Erickson. And this gentleman was probably important in establishing Lister's views on, 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 on infectious disease. At the time, there had been an epidemic of erysipelas on his ward, Erickson urged that isolation facilities were vital and that separate staff should look after infected patients. Lectured, le Lister lectured to the medical students at the time, focusing on hostile gangrene in the microscope. And so even at this stage, as a, as a very uh, early, early junior doctor, he was making impact. Another mentor was William Sharpey, the anatomist and physiologist. He was Scottish, and so he recommended the next stage of Lister's career by spending time with the great James Sine in Scotland. And Lister's intention had been to spend one month in that institution before spending time in continental Europe on the grand surgical tour that so many surgeons set out upon. However, Lister remained in Scotland for the next 24 years. He spent time as resident to James Sine in the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, and this quote from from uh, from Lister to his uh, in a letter uh, to his father really captures his enthusiasm for his job. If the love of surgery is proof of a person being adapted for it, then certainly I am fitted to be a surgeon, for thou canst hardly conceive a degree of enjoyment that I am from day to day experiencing in this bloody and butcherly department of the art of healing, and. I think this is a similar sentiment shared by most of the juniors in the department at the moment. So Lister thrived in Edinburgh. He received his FRCS from Edinburgh. He became Clark, lecturer, and an important researcher in the department of Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. And he was appointed the, the chief, uh, as it were, the, the head dresser surgeon, um, with a sign being referred to as the master. He spent time in the private practice of James Sine and really got to know him well to the point where actually he he ultimately married James Sine's daughter Agnes and um and he would then spend he would then after a short period of time in Paris return to Edinburgh and was appointed assistant surgeon to James Sine in the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh where he published extensively on an, a number of topics including importantly coagulation at the time However, the time had come for Lister to develop further out with the shadow of James Sine. And so it was that in the, as the, as the, the, with the death of the, the Regis, or the, sorry, the, 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 the Regis Professor of Surgery in Glasgow Royal, uh, Laurie, uh, suffered a stroke. There was an opportunity for, 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 
for uh, Lister to, to, to move elsewhere. And this slide shows the surgical block at the time, which had recently been finished in 1860. But at the same time, the, it showed the, 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 the state of Glasgow at that time, a city which was, was known to have squalor. And the fact as well that this hospital block had been built close to cholera pits. And so this was a challenging environment. He was appointed Regis Professor of Surgery, um, and however, and that was in 1860. However, his application to Glasgow Royal Infirmary was was harder. His initial application was rejected by the chair of the Royal Infirmary Board, David Smith, with the comment, "But our institution is a curative one, and not an educational one." And often, and so often, it was in the day that it took almost 19 months before Lister was appointed to Glasgow Royal Infirmary, and so he spent that time lecturing with the university, focusing the work and research he was doing. He, he, this was in one lecture to in the winter season to the to the students, focusing on the importance of s surgeons uh, and f anatomy and physiology. And uh, he valued the importance of, of making uh, amputation stumps as serviceable as possible and recounted the tale of an amputation of both legs in which the patient was still able to dance the Highland Fling. This, you know, this the, his 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 notoriety as a teacher spread, and he ended up developing one of the largest student classes in the UK, with 182 pupils, and 160 of them would sign the petition, you know, looking and helping him in his appointment to Glasgow Royal Infirmary. <clears throat> and if we put it into the context of really what Joseph Lister was dealing with at the time, for an amputation which was a common operation performed by a, a surgeon, the mortality of this was, was incredible. So if we look at the mortality in the around about that time in Glasgow, it could stand from 36 to 52% mortality associated with that. Similar s level in Edinburgh, slightly better in London, similar in continental Europe. And so it was that Sir James Simpson, who was the discoverer and the first user of chloroform, remarked that a man laid in the operating table in one of our surgical hospitals would be exposed to more chance of death than an English soldier in the field of Waterloo. And this really takes us to the, 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 the important work that Lister became famous for. At that time, he kind of threw himself into his care of his patients from 1860 and for the first few years that's what he was focused on and but with the with the direction of a Thomas Anderson a professor of chemistry at Glasgow University he was told of of Pasteur's germ theory Anderson provided them with the carbolic acid which was in a sense more akin to chrysoate and with the experience that Lister had found from his mentors previously, his work with microscopy, he set about ridding his patients of the putrefaction and infection that was that was was killing them and causing this high mortality. And one of the problems was really compound fractures in the day. These were associated with a high high mortality when the when a fracture caused the bone to break through the surface of the skin. And really, he, he set about in an organized fashion developing a strategy for investigating this. Now, the first patient he tried his technique on had a compound fracture, and he treated it with co cotton wool soaked in carbolic acid. He had a, a three-month hospital stay, and this unified with a, a, false, a false joint. He tried again that month on another patient, but this, in this case, uh, infection did take hold and the patient had a 12-month hospital stay and ultimately Lister referred to the, this case as being improperly managed. Possibly he wasn't in the hospital during that entire man's stay and, and, and felt regret. And he would have to wait another five months before he had an opportunity to try his, his antisepsis carbolic acid uh, technique once again. And this is probably the case that is known well in the literature. The previous two are not well accounted for in his publications. And this was the case of a 11-year-old a potter named James uh, uh, Greenlees, who on the 12th of August came into hostel with a fracture over his, his lower limb, a puncture wound from a cart that had uh, trailed over his leg, approximately an inch long, three inches, half an inch uh, across, and and laying lying over the line of the fracture, and treatment for this consisted of 
of, of undiluted carbolic acid soaked into a dressing uh, and, and then covered with tinfoil to prevent evaporation. And this was the first case that w of the 11 cases that Lister collected over two years uh, that would form the series of publications in the, in the Lancet. And from these 11 cases, one patient underwent amputation but lived and one died, the result of a bony fragment entering his, his femoral artery. And so this was unprecedented in terms of the, 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 the benefit. And so the antiseptic principle was therefore born in these wards of Glasgow Memorial Infirmary. And so it wasn't just a strategy for dressing, however, that Lister wanted to develop. He wanted desperately to cleanse the air and he had multiple iterations of a, of a carbolic acid sprayer. And this, this was used as far away as Aberdeen within a few years. And this is the great Alexander Ogston who discovered Staph aureus, uh, you implementing the carbolic spray out with Glasgow Royal Infirmary. And I suppose Lister eloquently described what he was what he was feeling uh, at this time and in a, in a speech to the BMA he mentioned that germ theory of pur putrefaction is the pole star which will guide you safely through what would otherwise be a navigation of hopeless difficulty you must be able to see with your mental eye the septic ferment as distinctly as we see flies and other insects with a corporeal eye if you can you'll be properly on your guard against them but there was significant resistance to Joseph Lister's theories, particularly by James Simpson that I mentioned earlier. There were anonymous letters published in the Edinburgh Daily Review that criticised Lister, saying all he was doing was rep re reproducing continental medical practice. There was significant confusion over the discovery of carbolic acid. He never claimed to have discovered it. And then there was the inappropriate use of carbolic acid and, and deaths were caused by the great Cocker and Bill Roth by use, pouring it neat onto wounds. And then Glasgow would lose Lister and he would return to Edinburgh. He took up the position of Regis Professor of Surgery in 1869 and this was brought about by the, the unwellness of James Simpson, his mentor who suffered a stroke and soon after died. At the same time, Joseph Lister's father passed away as well. In Edinburgh, he refined his antiseptic techniques and, and threw himself into ongoing research, including education of over 192 dresser surgeons over that period of time. And in, in total, Lister would have educated over 1,600 students in his, in his time in, 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 in Scotland. He had the opportunity during these years to, to spread the word in North America uh, during the great uh, North American uh, con uh, Centennial Exposition. And, and, but at the same time, Edinburgh could not keep a hold of Lister and he was in a world, on, a, on a mission to convert the world to, to Listerism. Um, he then took up post in King's College London Hospital in 1877 and there again he made significant resistance. His teaching was only really finally accepted when he had a particularly complex operation to perform of rewiring a patella. And it was only through that, an operation um, which was open, which required a long period of time, that, 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 that and this proved to be a, an ant a demonstration of his antiseptic system that had removed forever the threat of hospital disease. While in London, he obviously received many accolades in his, that, that had come to bear from his work uh, while he was in Scotland. He had lanced um, a, an abscess, obviously using an antiseptic technique from Queen Victoria's axilla, and this no doubt helped on his way to him achieving a, a, to a, barren, a, a barren status and a knight in 18, 1883. But at the same time, he also abandoned the use of his carbolic sprayer, uh, as it was increasingly clear that it was not the air that bore the infection, but rather the importance was making sure that the, the wound was clear of infection. He subsequently, while on holiday in, in Italy, his, his wife died of, of Agnes died of, of a pneumonia, uh, and this really forced his retirement. However, he continued to have a significant role within the Royal Society and became president in 1895. And really, his, 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 his position there was more related to the work in physiology that he published rather than his antiseptic work. He received a peerage in 1897 and, and, and freedom of Edinburgh, Glasgow and London around that time. He was also the first mem uh, person to receive the, the new Order of the Merit 
a war set up by Edward the Seventh, and then you know he lived and then he lived out the rest of his life until eighteen nineteen twelve in in relative isolation, and he had he had no he had he he bore no no children, and so his he wished to be buried with Agnes in uh, in Hampstead Cemetery, but his funeral service was was conducted in Westminster Abbey, and a plaque was raised there and close to to Darwin, and maybe. M- Notably, in this time, he had the opportunity to be present at Pasteur's Jubilee, where he congratulated him on on the work that he helped uh, spread around the world. So the legacy of Lister, I've covered some of these points already and certainly can focus on on outcomes, service provision, surgical invitation, training and, and, and education. Progress has obviously been made since Lister's time in the management of of compound fractures. We can see here this um, this unfortunate American footballer has has a has a has an awful injury, but certainly he would he would expect to be recover from this and and certainly not be f- forced to go through an amputation or have any significant risk to his life. And really, that has been the result of in you know, a development of orthopedic techniques like external fixation. But at the same time, I, I know nothing really other than the limited experience I had 15 years ago of, of such orthopaedic practices now. And that's partly borne by the fact of what, what Lister did in addition to his, 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 his antiseptic technique. He was a fastidious auditor and recorder of outcomes for his patients. And this is a log of one of, uh, of, of, of the wards in Edinburgh where he would record in great detail the patient, not only their condition, but their, their follow-up, their outcomes. And this level of audit and detailed recording ultimately led in to the, the development of, of surgical specialization where it was seen that different uh, patients were best managed by specific surgeons with specific interests in, in specific conditions. And this has really shaped uh, the, 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 the legacy of, of surgeons over the last 150 years, such as we have vascular surgeons, neurosurgeons, and even pancreatic surgeons dealing with uh, of, of, of patients of, of their particular interest and focus. Now that level, uh, that that the process of discussing outcomes, whether they be good or bad, is vital to improving outcome. And his legacy and attention to detail, even locally within Scotland, led to the Scottish Audit of Surgical Mortality, which is now the Scottish Morbidity and Mortality Programme. And I think you know it's important to highlight his approach to improve patient safety and, and focus on outcomes is in, in, a, in having an infection-free survival was is really was Slister's surgical goal. This combined with anesthesia and his principles enabled surgeons to move away from the exploits of Robert Liston and really to take their time. And so his legacy is, is also a philosophical one as much as it is practical. He obviously built the pillar of 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 antiseptic pre-surgical and post-surgical care but also he had many other pillars which his work was important in establishing such as the role of inflammation and wound healing microscopic analysis of pathological um, and and microbiological diagnosis as part of a surgeon's role as well as wound management and, and, and good ward care in at the time of, of Lister, uh, infirmaries in, um, were hitherto notorious for erysiphilis, pyema, hostile gangrene and tetanus, and Lister essentially abolished those. And we can see by looking at the, the, Royal, the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow, the Western and Victorian Infirmary, so the main hostels in Glasgow in 1855, only 198 operations were performed that year across all those hospitals. So that was just as, 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 as Lister was starting his career. But by the end of career in Glasgow, that, that number was almost tenfold. And so operations went from being a very small part of a hospital and a surgeon's workload to, to, to their mainstay. And not and, and that it was incredible to see when by the time of you know Lister's death, operative mortality in certain units in London were quoted as two percent. And that was, you know, con- compared with 50% for certain conditions at the time of, of his training. Um, and really that's clear proof in the, the revolution which he started. And and so in a way, you know, we can, this quote from his mentor, Sir uh, Eric Erickson, I think we should dwell on for a little bit. 
The abdomen, chest and brain will be forever closed to operations by a wise and humane surgeon. But Lister's activities and, and developments made these chambers of the bodies were now accessible. And so Lister was the man who made surgery safe, yes. But if we look at this timeline, we can see from 1865, around the time his work commenced and soon after published, within a few years, Bill Roth had performed an esophagectomy, McEwen, a resection of an intracranial meningioma. Uh, Bill Roth then resection of the stomach liver resections were then performed a few years after Courvoisier performed complex biliary surgery pancreas was wasn't even was 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 open to 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 surgical intervention a distal pancreatectomy was before, performed in 1893 and even by 1912 a, a pancreatic duodenectomy had been performed so within 40 years we had gone from essentially managing uh, s uh, peripheral injuries or operations on the on the exterior of the body to being able to perform all manner of these operations and so really Lister was not only that was the man who made surgery possible and and two ex examples of this from Glasgow Royal Infirmary were as I mentioned Sir William McEwen uh, a notable uh, general surgeon but also the first man to perform a, a resection of an intracranial a brain tumour in the form of meningioma before even Harvey Cushing of Hopkins fame. Also, James Hogarth Pringle uh, on the right was was a was was uh, uh, one of Lister's dresser surgeons in his early career. This man was born in Sydney and uh, was famous for the control of liver blood flow in the form of the, the Pringle manoeuvre, but as well as that, he was uh, instigated hindquarter amputations, melanoma, excisions, um, and also the first man in the UK to perform uh, a, 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 um, a vein graft for arterial reconstruction. And it's interesting to see that in this picture from Lister sitting in the front row, George Hogarth Pringle, that was a... Uh, 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 his father sat behind him and they were both residents in Edinburgh together and it was George Hogarth Pringle who took the antiseptic technique and spread it to the southern hemisphere through Sydney. And that spreading of Lester's message would, would continue around the world. And so it was uh, we, uh, the, even the, 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 the North American institutions, as I mentioned, these surgeons from, from, from would often visit Europe and th at that time they were picking up on, on Lister's technique and in this f this uh, John Singer Sargent's iconic 1906 painting of the four doctors of Hopkins we have Osler, Halstead at the back, Kelly and Welsh and it was William Halstead essentially the father of American uh, modern surgery who adopted their carbolic acid uh, technique of 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 Lister, but unfortunately his wife and scrub nurse quickly developed contact dermatitis when it was used in preparation for, for, for patients operating. And so he asked the Goodyear company to develop rubber gloves for his wife. And so our, our dermatitis was cured and there was claims that he was more dexterous as a result of the wearing these gloves. And, uh, and really this was the first instance where rubber gloves were used in, in theater. Uh, not so much to, to, to prevent the spread of infection, but rather at that time to really protect the staff from the, the carbolic acid techniques that Lister had instigated. And so his sur surgical innovation continued. He, he was, he was, he was uh, adamant that amputation should be minimised, and so he developed an operation for uh, excision of tuberculous joints to preserve the hand. He was a believer in hematoma removal via drains. He was also the first to, to promote exsanguination by elevation and the application of a tourniquet in the, to, to allow surgery to be performed in the hand and, and, the, and the leg. And particularly when he was in Edinburgh, he, he, he set about um, the, the, on the problem of, of minimizing infections related to uh, surgical suture material. And there would often be secondary hemorrhage when these sutures and ligatures, which were usually silk, became infected. And so he wanted to develop an absorbable suture that was also was also as, as antiseptic as possible. And he was the first developer of chromic cat gut. And it was really when he was in Philadelphia lecturing in a particularly long lecture that uh, a Robert Wood Johnson would hear him talk 
and along with his brother thought this was an excellent opportunity to make some money. And so they set up a company, Johnson & Johnson, that you will undoubtedly have heard of, that has now, as of December 2020, become the 10th the largest uh, company in the world by market capitalization. And they, they based their first endeavors on replicating the antiseptic technique and helping achieve what surgeons required at that time to achieve it through uh, sterile instruments and, and suture material. And this is an, uh, an example of another company that, 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 that Lister corresponded with from the, the Royal College of Surgeons archives of armor sutures as he set about you know, making a, a, a highlighting the importance of, 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 of material that would not promote infection within wounds and would be absorbable. So Lister's relevance to surgery today, it's hard not to think how you know how now that as we manage patients behind masks and PPE and we worry for them becoming infected as we try and can teach them we try and treat them for other conditions and and realize that that once again the importance of hand hygiene and overcrowding had, had is something I suppose up until recently we thought we had left in the time of Lister. His revolutionary impact we's, he's had upon uh, the 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 art of surgery is hard to fathom and. And, and so the challenges we, he faced today have become increasingly relevant. And as a surgeon who tries to do research, I suppose I can see clearly the work of, of, of Lister and, and the challenges he faced and, and also the importance of challenging medical dogma, resisting scepticism and hostility to change and really placing patients' experience at the heart of, of med medical practice. And these are some of the points that, that, are, that, that are as important as the work that he did in terms of developing an antiseptic technique. And so I, I, I finish in this plaque that sits outside Glasgow Royal, close to where his Lister's, Lister's ward uh, once stood. And this this quote this inscription at the bottom was from Ovid's first book of Metamorphosis, and is the crest that sits uh, the, the crest of the worshipful society of the apothecaries, and it reads throughout the world they speak of me as a bringer of help, and I suppose that has been what Sir Lister's legacy has has been, and it's fitting that it sits as it does outside the place where that work was first performed in Glasgow Royal Infirmary. So thank you, friends of GRI, for giving me the opportunity to to host this section today. Thanks.